Praise the Lord. It's happened again. Another school shooting and two school threats. Good morning. That's right. There has been more of a school shooting with two threats that are happening. Let's deal with the threats first. And this goes all the way back to November 30th and and also and also to when let's go to the let's go to the threats. On campus, 20 minutes later, the victim is expected to make a. This is WFTV tonight. And we begin tonight with some breaking news. We now know the name of the 16 year old suspect that today's shooting that left a high school senior injured on a Seminole County campus today. Good evening, I'm Greg Warman. And good evening, I'm Martha Sigalski. This is the young suspect we're talking about. His name is Javarius Smith. This is Javarius what we know Smith. about what happened. He's facing several charges in connection with today's shooting, including first degree attempted murder, disturbing the peace at a school, firing a weapon on school property, and possession of a weapon on school property. The victim in the shooting right now in the hospital tonight. Let's go over how quickly these dramatic events unfolded today. Sanford police say around 11.57, a school resource officer reported a weapon was on campus and that shots had been fired. A minute later, a second resource officer found the victim near the Tomahawk building on campus. The officer requested additional law enforcement. The school was then placed on lockdown. By 12.03, police had released a substance description, and by 12.12, the campus was deemed safe enough to take the victim to the hospital. By 2020, police had that suspect in custody. Then by 148, the campus had been cleared of any threat, Craig. And Martha, this adds to what had been a string of violent incidents in and around schools across Central Florida before the winter break. Nick Pampatonis is live outside Seminole High School now. Nick, police say this shooting was caused by a common problem over girls. Yeah, the police saying this was not caused by drugs, not caused by gangs, but a girl. The report that we got earlier this evening showing a lot of back and forth between the suspect and the victim over the past six days or so. That led to the incident today. Another example of an off-campus problem being brought into a building like this and affecting the wider community. This is the worst um day for any school system. Another emotional day for parents and students in Central Florida. Police called to Seminole High School around noon after gunshots rang through the halls. Officers say the shooting happened in the Tomahawk building, a 16-year-old hitting an 18-year-old three times in a heated argument about a girl. He was caught elsewhere on campus 20 minutes later. The victim is expected to make a full recovery. Our focus now is to make sure that all aspects of the investigations are thoroughly addressed and charges are filed against the suspect. Police pleaded for parents to stay away from campus at first, many lining up outside the entrance as the news spread. I was actually on the phone with my wife, and uh, and I tell her, and uh, we panic. We panic. Luckily, we were able to reach my son. He says he's okay for right now. An hour later, code red was lifted grade by grade, allowing families to reunite and catch their breath. Actually, I'm, I'm like calmer than I thought I would be because I, I feel like it's so like normalized. So like we're constantly, like, stuff is constantly like, happening like this every day. <laughs> Shootings are still a rare event inside Central Florida schools, but threats and fights are increasingly becoming common in Seminole County. The district ended the fall semester with a string of incidents on different campuses. Students and administrators say they're sparked by online interactions that carry over into reality. We go through this constantly and it's not, it's just not fair. What is being done to calm the tensions that might be existing, keep the social media fights online instead of in person with these weapons? Well, and as Chief mentioned, we are working closely with our law enforcement partners, both the, the Sanford Police Department and the Seminole County Sheriff's Office on all of our programs throughout all of our schools to address exactly those issues. Listen, you, you just gotta, you just gotta pray and make sure that your kid uh, goes to school right, comes back home safe. Um, just gotta keep his head up and uh, just tell him, hey, you know, you know, he knows what to do. 
Administrators say tomorrow's school day will start normally. Counselors will be available for any students that might need that mental health help. And you would think some folks will sign up for that tomorrow. Nick, do they know how this young suspect got a 9 millimeter handgun into the building? That's one of those details, Greg, that has not been publicly released, if they even know that right now. Police were hoping to interview the suspect, and they did interview the suspect after that press conference. But again, that details all several other ones that we've been looking into, not yet known. We're hoping some of those come out tomorrow. Live in Sanford, Nick Papantonis, WFTV Tonight. And our crews on the scene spoke with a family of that 18-year-old victim. His name is Javon McIntyre, and he's a senior. You can see in this photo of him in the football uniform. He was a star cornerback for the school's team. His family says he was shot in the wrist and is undergoing surgery tonight. They do expect him to make a full recovery. And it's not just Seminole Public Schools that are seeing this increase in fighting and violence this year. Fights have been breaking out in and around Orange County schools. We told you last month how dozens of kids ran from a shooting not far from the Carver Middle School campus after school let out. The community held a town hall to do something about it. And Commissioner Bakari Burns proposed hiring safety coaches to work with students on issues before escalating to police intervention. We will continue to follow today's shooting at Seminole High School. We'll let you know when investigators release information about where that 16-year-old shooter got the gun and any developments when he goes before a judge tomorrow morning. He'll bring it all to you on air and on WFTV.com. And tomorrow's the court date, and we'll let you know what happens on tomorrow's Give Me a Break. And speaking of break, next, a school threat that happened. Two of them. Two of them today. We're going to hear from Fox 4 Dallas Worth and from 12 News and 12 News Now when we come back. Look, y'all, I keep telling you guys every time, don't be threatening our schools. Our children need to go to school, get their education, and get back home safely. That's the whole purpose of a child going to school. When I hear, when I hear stories of like something like this, it makes me sick. Like today, two threats in Netherlands and Lumberton who were forced on lockdown. So let's bring you some four-minute clips. First from Fox 4. This can't be right. The knot were detained and released. Two people, one of them a student, one of them not, were detained and released after threats were called into two different high schools in Denton today. As a precaution, a few campuses were put on lockdown or lockout. Fox 4's Macy Jenkins is live in Denton tonight after talking with parents and students. Macy. Hi, Steve. Well, five schools here in Denton were placed on lockdown or lockout as police investigated a threatening phone call against two campuses. Now, officers searched those campuses. They found no weapons and no evidence that there were any credible threats against any students or staff. Oh my goodness, so scared. I just dropped her off. Less than two hours into the school day on Wednesday, students at Denton High School and Ryan High School were placed on lockdown with no one allowed in or out. Sky 4 video captured Denton police surrounding both campuses after police received an anonymous phone call just before 10 a.m. Police say the caller demanded Denton High be evacuated or a shooting would take place. When I originally showed up, um, the area was very blocked off. Um, there was um, helicopters in the sky. Sophomore Joanna Dew says there was a brief announcement on the intercom during second period. We just went into lockdown and we didn't really get much information from the teachers. Officers searched the two schools but found no weapons at either. Angela Dockery says she got a call from her daughter, a sophomore at Denton High. She sounded really calm and said that they could hear police officers in the hallway. Others were a bit more nervous. There were a lot of people who were like anxious and like there were a few girls who were like crying, but it was pretty kind of serious. serious. Yeah. As a precaution, Dyer High, Newton Razor Elementary, and Calhoun Middle Schools were all placed on a soft lockout. Police say two people were detained for questioning, one a Denton High School student. The other person detained at Ryan High School was not listed as a student, and it's unclear what that person was doing on campus. 
Neither had weapons and both were ruled out as suspects. By noon, the lockdowns were lifted and classes returned to normal. And so I'm gonna go ahead and pick her up. So, better safe than sorry. This news comes just a month after a series of social media threats in North Texas and across the country forced schools to enhance security. Students in Flower Mound ISD, Louisville ISD, Frisco ISD and others were arrested for making those hoax threats. Sadly, I think they've kind of gotten used to it to a certain degree, kind of a sign of the times. Denton police say they will continue to work with the FBI to investigate any leads. Students, parents, and teachers can all expect increased police presence on Denton ISD campuses this week. Now here's 12 news now that the you tell you the same thing. Any different. It's about twin lockdowns at schools in Lumberton and Nederland. Now questions about twin So there's two. Lockdown schools in Lumberton and, and Nederland. Now, in Nederland, the high school was impacted. And in Lumberton, both the high school and the middle school were locked down. Now, district officials and police say that threats were called in and that they were bogus. Students were never in any danger. So what about the suspects, those who called in these threats? What should happen to them? What will happen? Phillies reporter James Grant is live tonight with the legal implications. Letitia Jordan, a stern message from police as they try to track down who is responsible. And if they get caught, they could face some serious consequences. Many parents tonight relieved to be reunited with their kids. Two school threats in a matter of hours. First, Nederland High School was put on lockdown for about an hour. Once that school was given the all clear, another threat. This one aimed at Lumberton ISD. Both Lumberton High School and Middle School were put on lockdown. That lockdown lasted about 30 minutes before both campuses were given the all clear. Both Lumberton and Nederland police say the two threats were bogus. For some family members of Nederland students, like Luis Hernandez, it was a gut-wrenching feeling during the lockdown. They should face the consequences, but they should also reflect on their actions because they could have hurt someone or someone they used to care about and all that, and that will reflect what we have to do in the near future. Hernandez says he went to the high school so he could be there to pick up his sister once the all clear was given. He says the whole ordeal really caught him off guard. Ms. Niederland and Lumberton police continue to investigate these two school threats. Whoever is responsible could face to two years in jail. Robertson, James Grant, 12 minutes. So like we heard, he could face up to two years in jail. If you guys out there making these threats, you guys need to be fessing up to the crime and saying, it was me. But the, these threats aren't, but let me tell you, let me tell you something right now. We've just heard from two, from two schools that have threats and we've heard from a school shooting and when we come back we're going to we're going to show you a clip from the principal's office about a student who threatened a teacher but he was just joking around it's a prime example of not child's play then we're going to look at the dual family journal which has a different view on this stay tuned so we're focusing on school threats. I mean, I've dealt with this topic since the day of the school shooting, or since Wick, or since TikTok. We just heard from two schools that were that played that looked at the lock that looked at the lockdown, and another one went on lockdown. Then we heard from a school shooter. And he was he was arrested. This is all a great example. This is not a great example. I'm going to show you a clip from notes from the premises office like I've been doing for the past week. And in this clip, a student, Anthony was, a student named Anthony was expelled for basically like threatening a teacher. At first, like, at first I looked at this, I was like, okay, but there was more to this. Take a look. 
tough day today huh i did not put you on a contract when i met with you this summer do you remember what the contract said so i couldn't get in trouble i will not give any teacher cause to send me out of class suspension will result in my termination termination i hope i'm not expelled because i'm supposed to be graduating this year and i'm trying to go into college so i can get a good job all right tell me what happened today so we were in chemistry class and he goes oh anthony you're supposed to be doing the work and i told him i was like i don't have it and he just got mad at me and kicked me out of class told me to get out and that's when i got mad and i used a couple so i want you to tell me what you said to him i told him you i sound looking bastard okay what what is in your head right now a lot oh anthony i don't even know what to say to you you have really got yourself in it this time you being frustrated and you thinking that what he did was wrong doesn't give you the license to insult him do you know that yeah i know that but, but then why did you do it? Just because he's a teacher doesn't mean he has the right to kick me out of class. Yes, he does. Yes, yes, he did. That does well, mean that. Yes. For asking a question on the class that I'm trying to ask, I mean, if I would have disrupted the class, if I would have said something, I had the class laughing or I had the class looking at me. But you know, can't time. F him off and, and insult trying, him. When I'm trying to work so that I can graduate, and so he kicks me out. That's all you said? Yeah. Just that? Up. Yeah. As if that's not enough. He came back and he said... That I was saying that I was going to punch him in his face. That's a threat. That's what, he put That's what I was talking about. Yeah, and I never said that. Because that is a threat, you understand? Yeah, I was I listening to Ms. what Ms. Caswell Anytime said. Anytime a threat is made toward a teacher, we take it very seriously. It holds a very serious suspension and often... Holds yes! Yes! I would never threaten a teacher. I would never threaten anyone personally. That's I never say I'm going to punch on. If I'm going to punch someone in the face, I'm just going to do it. I'm not going to say I'm going to punch him in the face because you know it's coming. Oh, I just can't believe this. I'm like sick over this. I really thought you were coming back to get things taken care of this year. I can't allow you back in. That's fine, man. I gotta tell you, I'm I'm very disappointed. I'm I am I'm absolutely I feel sick that I have to send you out. But I'm gonna try and find a way that you can still get your diploma. I don't want you getting your GED. I want you to get your diploma. This is Emily Leader. You are dismissed, however. Related to the subject, but there is more to this story. Just three days ago, the Door Family Journal, <coughs> excuse me, the Door Family Journal issued an article that says school threats are not child play. I'm gonna read you this, and we'll talk about it. Last year ended with a concerning wave in the education community after threats against the, the safety of schools were spread through social media. This situation uncovered a deeper problem. Our children and teenagers are not all right. These threats, which have mostly been started by children and teenagers within social media apps such as TikTok, Twitter, kept students, parents, teachers, staff, and authorities frightened during the last day of school on December 17th. When messages about violent attacks that would take place at the day of schools across the country began circling on TikTok. Although the day unfolded relatively in a calm local level, Miami-Dade County Public Schools had to increase police presence in school areas as preventive measures. But it wasn't the only time the schools the school districts had to fight this issue in 2021. According to a press release to a press release from MDCPS, from the beginning of the school year through December 7th, Miami-Dade Schools Police Department investigated 40 school threats all ruled credible or hoaxes, and made six arrests. It's a considerable number of consuming levels of stress, anxiety, and absenteeism increase in the population. And the resources of the authorities could well be used to protect schools from real dangers and are depleted every time a school threat is sent, which refers to any message that speaks to possible aggression against, against life or physical energy of others in the classroom. It's for the above all for the above that the events of the first half of the school year left many questions in the air that are worth clarifying. The main one is, what is happening with our children and teenagers in our community so that many of them become involved in these threats? According to Edwin Lopez, the chief, the chief police of Miami-Dade Schools Police Department, 
Most of the school threats received last year were made by students. But given the completely the issue, the interaction of the police, the school district, and finally the parents and the caregivers is the key to to these disruptive behaviors at the stress of family at schools. I mean, this is all an article. I'm not going to read this whole thing because we have a half hour, but there is one from a psychologist. But the question is, what is the child to do when finding a threat to avoid becoming a part of the problem? According to Farga, Christy Farga, the right thing to do is to call 911 and to scrap the threat. Another option is to contact the, local, the school board for the county school police department that is... That is probably throughout every school district. In addition, there are still some preconceptions about the mental health illness in people's minds, which is why some learn to live at home with children who suffer from depression or anxiety. But on the other hand, this behavior is also driven by the fact that it is very common for households to not have boundaries or consequences regarding the issue of technology and everything else. Like I've talked about in the uh, my cyber safety, we need to have parents. We need to have parents look after their kids' stuff, technology. You can't have the computer in their room and then expect those to get away with it. You can't have, you gotta monitor the progress, what they're doing. If you can do that, you can have your child be safe. That's basically the whole thing. The whole thing is basically comes down to this. You have to make sure that your child is safe. And threats like that, I mean, would you wanna send your child, you, you wanna see your child going to jail for threats? For a freaking school threat? Yes. You would have your child not to be charged as an adult for this crap. And it just makes me sick. I mean, I hear stories about people putting more police officers or school resource officers and saying this is what we need to do. That's that's perfect. Tear down the lockers, okay. Start searching our students every every morning when they come in. Okay, that's good. This addition to poor nutrition, lack of sleep, physical activity is causing them to be now thoughtful and focused, as well as diminish the ability to respond to critical situations and control their impulses. But in this sense, the absolute freedom of access technology is playing against young people because although electronic devices are part of everyday life, they have repercussions of basic skills. That's why at my old school, they blocked, they blocked Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, you can't get on Instagram, Facebook, or can't get on Facebook, can't get on Instagram, can't get on Twitter, you can't get on any social media sites. They have it blocked off. They used to have YouTube. I mean, when I was in fourth grade, when I was in fourth or third grade, YouTube was on. YouTube, YouTube was allowed to be on, and then years later, and then after that, it got cut off. But back in 2012, YouTube was back on. I don't know why. For me, the students think it was for educational purposes. Just use it for educational videos. Things have to change. If we don't change this, if we don't change what's going to happen throughout this year, not even this year, next year from now, we may have to do this again. This was the first shooting and the first threat of this school year. I'll be back in a moment. Before we leave, real quick, there's an Arctic mix happening. Make sure you're bundled up and warm. And don't go out. Make sure your heater's on and the power comes off. The power goes off, just it's a five to ten minute thing. Tomorrow on the broadcast, my explosive rant to the Abbeville ISD for viol probably violating the ADA, the American Disabilities Act. You don't want to miss that. That's all for this edition of Game Break Thursday. We'll see you again tomorrow for Game Break Friday. Have a nice day. Stay warm.